right, thank you, Dr. Schrader. As you can uh, see from your agendas, um, we have a jam-packed uh, list of things that we're going to cover today. Um, just, just to sort of set the stage here, you know, since the Affordable Care Act was signed in 2010, the Galen Institute has documented over 50 delays, modifications, redefinitions of specific language within the Affordable Care Act. However, after the last Supreme Court decision, which allowed the IRS to continue subsidies of health care plans under the federal marketplace, specific mandatory requirements, as you all are now aware, will start to roll out in a sequential basis, and this will be unimpeded, at least until 2016. And then we'll see what happens in 2016. Um, but let's go ahead and get started with the uh, presentations today. The first person is uh, Brett Fowler. Uh, Brett Fowler is a vice president and partner of Turner Woods and Smith Insurance, graduated from the University of Georgia Terry College of Business with a major in risk management and insurance. He specializes in individual and group employee benefits, and Brett will be giving us highlights of what we need to know coming up in the next year. Alrighty. So what you need to know in 15 minutes. So uh, we're going to go through this as uh, quickly as possible, but hit a lot of good subjects. And we're going to talk about group sizes of individual, small group, and things that will apply to large group. So hopefully, no matter where you are in that segment, there'll be something that applies to you. So just kind of starting out on the exchange open enrollment. Um, this year's individual open enrollment starts November 1st, and it runs through January 31st. So if you are a small business that's looking at doing individual plans, or you are an individual at this time, um, that will be the open enrollment time for starting a new plan. Um, we'll be able to apply for new coverages, and if you apply by December 15th, that coverage will be able to start by January 1st. Um, last day for coverage to sign up would be January 31st, and you'd have a start date of March 1st. So those are kind of the dates that we'd be looking at going into this year. Outside of those open enrollment dates, the only time you can apply for an individual plan is during open, is during, if you have a qualifying event. So either open enrollment or you have a qualifying event. Um, I was reading an article yesterday that I thought would be interesting to share. Um, it was a review of 394 different providers, uh, provider networks, and over 267 issuers of insurance. And they were reviewing all of the states and, and how narrow their networks were. Um, and Georgia was actually number one in, in regards to the states that have the most plans of those silver level metallic plans of what the subsidies are based off of, of having the most narrow networks. That 83% of our plans have a narrow network. So it is very important if you do have an individual plan or if you have a small group plan that's looking at doing individuals that they go through an advisor or they're, they're making sure to check that their doctors are in network. And um, we get many calls where They've, an employee has signed up through healthcare.gov or you know, with someone that, that wasn't sure of our area's networks and they're not able to go to the local hospital. And that's the worst thing that you want to find out because you're not able to sign up again until the next year. So if you do have somebody that decides that they're just not going to take coverage, um, then likely when they filed their taxes in 2015 for 2014, they, they saw the penalty assessed at that time. Um, the penalty is slowly increasing. It will be going up this year for 2015 to 2%, the greater of 2% of your income, um, or $325 per person for the year. In 2016, that number will climb to 2.5% um, per person, or $695, um, the greater of the two. So only the income amount over the individual um, tax filing threshold is where the penalty is assessed, and that amount is $10,150. So the amount above that is where the penalty would be. Uh, there is a cap on your penalty, so it's what the bronze level cost would be for a plan if you decided to, if you did purchase a plan. So that's $2,484 for an individual and just over $12,000 for a family. That would be what your max exposure would be from a penalty aspect. So we have seen the out-of-pocket limits um, in 2016. Um, 
go up slightly. Um, one of the things that HSS, HSS um, did clarify was that the plans embedded um, or the individual out-of-pocket deductibles, um, your out-of-pocket maximum can no, can no longer um, be just all assessed to the family total. So if you're an individual, your out-of-pocket maximum is $6,850. If it's a family, it's $13,700. So I'll use the example, if you have a family of four and you have one person that has a medical uh, condition that has surgery, maybe hospital stay, ends up meeting their $6,850 out-of-pocket maximum, then that person is then covered at 100% going forward. The rest of the family, the other three family members, could then total up the $6,850 to meet the total $13,700. Uh, while we have seen increases on the um, out-of-pocket maximum, we have seen HSA limits increase. Um, so you can see what the contribution amounts are. $3,350 for an individual. That's the same as 2015 as it will be in 2016. And then a slight increase um, for the family uh, contribution that you can make to your savings account. One thing I did want to note, and I'd put it in a side-by-side -side comparison here, is that the out-of-pocket maximum is different if it's an HSA plan compared to just a high deductible health plan. So you can see the HSA out-of-pocket maximum is slightly, slightly less there. Um, rates for 2016. I'm not here with a crystal ball to tell you where the rates are going to be, um, but I did want to point out, if you go to healthcare.gov, they do have a, a, an item called a rate review. So if an insurance carrier is planning to increase their rates more than 10%, then they have to file and submit that for federal and state review. Um, I did a review of last year's rates, and all, of all the rates that were submitted, those ended up being held true as what they were issued for the next year. So these are just averages based on the plan. Um, the percentage listed is could be different um, for your you know, particular situation based on whether you have family coverage, individual coverage, um, or what plan you have. But I know there's some carriers in the room, and uh, so before I get in trouble, like I said, these are just the proposed rates, and uh, we will find out towards the end of the third quarter, beginning of fourth quarter, where these actually end up following. So starting out just in alphabetical order with Aetna, their point of service network, um, they've it looks like it's going to be issued at about a 15.5% increase. Um, the HMO network is 13.9% to 19.7, and that's the Coventry plans. Aetna now owns Coventry, and they're in that HMO network. Um, I did list a couple of the small groups as well, just so you could see if they did file over 10%. So Aetna did issue at 10.95. At and again, these numbers are subject to change, but this is just that initial kind of review that everyone's looking at. As you can see on the Alliance side, quite a big increase at 37.85%. Um, the state is broken up into, into separate rating areas. And so our rating area for North Georgia and particularly Hall County is rating area 10. And we're one of the, uh, for Alliance, we're going to see the, the largest increase there. Um, there's a couple factors that, that come into play with that. In 2015, Alliance decreased their rates on the individual. So this is kind of making up for that decrease, um, as well as they're one of the only carriers in the market that doesn't have a drug card deductible on every, every one of their plans in the individual market. So we did see a lot of people that had brand name prescriptions taking the Alliant plan so they wouldn't have a drug card deductible, um, and in turn that can, can drive claims. So um, next carriers, Blue Cross Blue Shield. As I mentioned, uh, there are some plans that are not in network at the hospital. The HMO network with Blue Cross is one of those plans. So I didn't list that here because hopefully no one has signed up for that plan. And if you are, then make sure to, to transition here in 2016. Um, but they're predicted at 16.99% on their individual. And then again, small group is listed at 11.76. I talked to some of the carriers about this just to kind of get their feedback. Um, Blue Cross is hoping that that number ends up being in the 8 to 9% range. But again, um, it's still got to go through the full review process. And then finally, Humana um, really has the largest block of business in the individual market. They came into the um, exchange in 2014 and just really were well below everyone on the rates and, and kind of wrote most of the business, at least in our area. And so um, with that, looking at just over a 19% increase there. So three big things happened this summer. I want to touch a little bit on each one of them. Um, a couple things are carrier consolidation. So. On July 3rd, um, Aetna announced the purchase of Humana for $37 billion. And then um, on July 23rd, Anthem Blue Cross announced the purchase of Cigna. So both of these deals are expected to close in the second half of 2016. 
Um, I've talked to carriers from all parties, and they're still competing against each other at this point. It's business as usual. So if you're one of these carriers, I wouldn't, you know, you don't need to feel the need to, that you have to change plans right away. Um, and if you're looking at new business and one of them does come in competitive, then you can still look at that as a viable option. Um, when that deal closes, there'll be a transition period of getting everybody on one plan, kind of like it took place with Coventry and the purchase that Aetna had of, of Coventry. So we'll continue to see um, you know, cons carrier consolidation, but these are the two big deals that took place this summer. Um, it was predicted you know, early on when healthcare reform was passed that we were going to eventually probably have a big three of carriers, and it is trending that way uh, where we could end up having the big three as United Healthcare, you know, Anthem, Blue Cross, and then Aetna. But um, we'll continue to keep you updated as, as additional you know, consolidations do take place. Um, while some companies were purchased, there are some companies that have just decided to exit the market. Um, it's no longer viable for them to be a player in the market. Um, one of those is Assurant Health. And at the end of 2015, we will see that Assurant Health is leaving the market on their individual and small group fully insured plans. So those plans, if you're on one of them, it should be ending this year. It'll be during open enrollment and you would need to transition at that time. Um, January 31st, 2016, um, our a local plan to our area, Athens Area Health Plan Select, will be exiting the market. So when they exit the market, um, you, you, most people are in that small group segment with, with Athens Area, so your renewal is likely a 12-1, maybe a 1-1. Um, if you are during that time frame, there's no reason to, to worry and change now. You can just change it at renewal. But if you have renewed recently, then you will need, and it won't be renewing again before January 31st, you will need to look at making a carrier change prior to that February 1st date. Um, so one thing I do want to mention on Assurant Health, there are some carriers, um, some companies maybe here that have their self-funded product. Um, that product was purchased by National General and they're going to continue to operate that product. So it's in the five employee to 100 employee segment and that'll continue to be sold. Um, and if you have one of those plans, it'll be transitioned over into National General. Um, Next, uh, third big topic um, that kind of took place over the summer, and I'm sure Rich might talk about this uh, from the, um, just from the attorney standpoint, but on the same-sex marriage, I did want to mention from the carrier standpoint that same-sex spouses are now recognized in all 50 states. So if you have a fully insured plan, whether it be medical, dental, vision, then same-sex marriage is part of your plan at this point. If you have an employee that comes to you with a marriage certificate, it's going to be treated just like a marriage certificate of opposite sex. So we'll need to make sure to note that um, and add them, and that would just be a qualifying event like, uh, like any other would be. Um, next thing is uh, really, we talked about this last year, um, really only saw a couple, couple groups make this transition last year. Maybe saw more of a handful of carriers, um, of companies doing that this year, but small employers eliminating group plans for individual plans. It really depends on the group. Um, if you have a, a group at segment as far as their salaries go where they might qualify for subsidies, then we could see this as a, a viable option. Um, but again, you need to look at all the pros and cons of each side of it. If the employees are not going to qualify for a subsidy, then there's not a benefit unless you're just trying to get out of, out of the market. So I did list a couple pros and cons that I wanted to go through. Uh, one thing we find in that small group segment is that it's usually the business owner that's having to deal with the insurance. They don't have enough employees to have an HR, or maybe an office manager that's doing it. And so the advantage for that individual is that they don't have to deal with it anymore. So that, that might be enough for them to get out of it and just let the employee go get their own individual plan, pick the company and the deductible they want and be done with it. Um, we've seen companies do that, maybe even increase salaries just to get out of the market. But there's some negative impacts on that um, as far as that first year you might be okay, but then the next year um, there are some issues that come about. The employee now no longer sees that as a benefit. Um, they've quickly forgotten that you've increased their pay. And, you know, open enrollment is only during a set time frame. So if I hire an employee from a recruitment standpoint and I bring that employee on in April of 2016 and, and he hasn't had coverage for the first three months of the year, he can't go get an individual plan because open enrollment is closed. So he wouldn't be able to start coverage till January 1st of 2017. And if he's looking at another job that maybe is offering benefits, then that could be a decision as far as coming to you or not. So, um, and then lastly, just the, the two things, 
really the, the drug card deductible on individual plans is typically higher. Um, it can be $500 up to $1,500, and even with some plans, it's the same as the medical deductible. So something you really need to look at, and then typically the plans are just not as strong, not as robust of a benefit. Um, small group segment at this time is 2 to 49. So in that small group segment, the only things that carriers can ask for, zip code, date of birth, whether you're a tobacco user or not. In 2016, that's going to be expanding to the 50 to 99 market as well. So if you're in that, in that group segment, then you will, that, that, will, that will be the only thing that the carriers are looking at at that point. Um, if you have a group that's maybe a high-risk group, you have a lot of claims in that 50 to 99 and you've been rated up previously because they've looked at your medical conditions, this could end up being a benefit um, or, or keeping relatively close to your rates right now. But for those groups that are healthy groups and, and typically run, their claims run good, you know, well year in and year out, this is going to be tough because you're not, no longer going to get the benefit of having those good claims and you will see the rates increase at that time. So um, just one thing to think about if you are in that 50 to 99 segment is that it might be worth looking at the self-insured. There's um, options that are out there. So as your renewal comes up this year, you want to make sure to look at all available options in the marketplace. Um, if we do see these healthy groups go to more of a fully insured platform so they can actually have their health taken into account, we could end up seeing some adverse selection on the fully insured side. And with that, we would just see the unhealthy groups taking those community rated rates, uh, which in turn could end up driving the cost up. So um, I know it's a, a lot of information all packed into it. There's a few more items that we'll get to in the Q&A portion. But um, if you have any questions, again, get those to us and, and we'll be happy to answer them at that time. Thank you.